we've lost another uh, neighbor to COVID-19. Uh, she was in her 60s. She had significant medical conditions. Uh, we now have lost 41 people uh, to this illness. Uh, 30 uh, Caucasian, seven African Americans, four of another race, 23 females and 18 males. Uh, obviously we're thinking about them and their families and grieving with them in these unprecedented times. Uh, testing, uh, we'll go over testing numbers. Uh, at this point moving forward, essentially the way we've been operating uh, with the, the virus and with the strategies has changed. So uh, we now, as part of restart and going forward, are going to have to do uh, extremely robust testing. Uh, so what's important is the testing numbers, and we know that testing numbers drive percentages of positives. So we've had uh, essentially 8.3% over the last week of positive uh, uh, cases related to how many tests we got back. So let's go over some testing numbers. Uh, so far there's been 14,507 tests administered, 14,249 tests have been returned, 790 have been returned since yesterday. So 790 tests came back. You apply the 8.3 percent to that, uh, that should be where your new positive caseload is. It's actually down a little bit from that. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, there have been 11,000 now at this point, 78 positive tests. That is 63 more cases, which is 8% of 790 tests. Uh, we have 13,071 negatives. We have 258 pending tests right now. Uh, we received a lot of tests. Uh, we're doing more testing today uh, to meet the, the mandate that we need to average certain numbers of tests a day to essentially open up our economy. Uh, we're on pace now to meet that with our, our average daily uh, number. Uh, but certainly we know we have 258 tests we'll probably receive back tomorrow. We know we'll probably get some back that we're doing today, maybe even tomorrow. So the reality is, is as long as we're doing this robust testing, we're gonna get larger numbers. It's the percentages that are gonna matter. Uh, and so 8% today, uh, a little bit down from the 8.3% total of testing, but we do have 63 new cases, and we'll go over those in a minute. Um, let's see, yesterday we uh, sent out 406 tests. Sent out yesterday, we have 258 pending today. So again, we're getting some of these tests back essentially within 24 hours at some of these labs. Uh, we currently have 1,178 cases, up from 1,015 yesterday, so 63 new cases, 8% of the tests we received. Uh, certainly, uh, when we uh, look at that, the rates have been between 7.8 and 8.3% of all the testing we do. Uh, that's been our positive, our infectious rates, essentially. Uh, we've been aligned with other states throughout this process that have not been hit as hard as we have. Arkansas, Tennessee, uh, the, our numbers are more reflective of what's happened in those states than certainly uh, other parts of New York State. Uh, we'll look at who, uh, who those cases are in a minute here. Um, hospitalizations, we have 51 individuals in the hospital. This is up a little bit from yesterday. Uh, this represents 10% of our active cases. We have 12 individuals uh, in critical condition. This is down a little bit from yesterday. Uh, representing 2% of our active cases. Uh, our hospitalization rates are fine. Uh, they've stabilized over this process. There's gonna be a little bit of fluctuation now back and forth because uh, the right now, this period of time in our fight with COVID, we, uh, most of our folks who have been testing positive are related to assisted living facilities and nursing homes. So nursing homes have been very cautious sending folks to uh, the hospital when they didn't need to be in the hospital, so that's getting worked out. But certainly uh, our most vulnerable population in the community has been impacted by this now. And so that's going to lead to uh, hospital discharges, but then people going back to the hospital uh, as the, the fight with COVID-19 uh, progresses uh, within the, themselves. So we expect that 
this is kind of going to be the area where we are with hospitalizations uh, for the next couple weeks at least uh, as we see uh, discharges, but we see uh, people from these vulnerable communities uh, having to go into the hospital because they're getting sicker. Uh, to date, we've had 145 people in total released from the hospital. That's up at eight from yesterday. So even though our hospital's uh, numbers are up a little bit, we had eight people leave, meaning that there are that many more people that were either sick or essentially a nursing home may have just pushed an individual to the hospital uh, because they're not equipped uh, to handle the COVID patient and they can do that. Uh, and so we're working through that process with them. So uh, overall, our hospitalization rates are fine. We're very, very lucky we have the infrastructure we have in this community uh, and it's helped us perform very well by helping get people better, uh, but also uh, it's prepared us well uh, in this fight with COVID. Uh, okay, so overall we have uh, 1178, that's our red curve, that's up 63. Uh, we have 505 active cases, our yellow curve, that's up 53 cases. Again, the yellow curve, the rules have changed in the middle of this, our active cases. Uh, we went from a seven day period of time with no symptoms where you were a recovery. Now those rules have changed. Uh, 14 days now for seniors. Most of our new cases are seniors. So that's gonna make that yellow curve stay uh, with larger numbers longer. What will happen essentially in a week or so, you'll see a drastic drop uh, because many of these cases will be at that 14 day period, people will be recovering. Uh, but until then, that number is gonna just go up essentially uh, because the only individuals that could come off would be those who have gotten better, of seven straight days of no symptoms, three straight days of no temperature uh, or fever, and those would be only be related to the community spread cases community spread cases are only about a third of our cases right now. So again, the way we have to pivot in this fight and pivot with the data is based off of the, the way that the rules are changing. And if a rule changes, a guideline changes, we need to look at the, the, the whole assessment of what we're doing a little bit differently. Um, and so that's that. Uh, we've had 632 people recover. That's our green curve, that's up nine. Uh, we now have 164 people out of our positive cases that are household contacts, uh, up 12 from yesterday. We have 25 new cases uh, that are affiliated with senior living facilities. So out of our 63 cases, 37 are related to contacts and affiliations, 26 from community spread. Our community spread five day average is 19. So we usually work off seven day averages. Our last seven day average was 11. Uh, the week before was around 19. Now we're essentially back where we were the week before. Uh, we've had some better weather uh, that helps with community spread. People are out there, they're, they're, there's more interaction. We certainly anticipate as we go into a restart that we'll have more community spread cases. Uh, there'll be more density. Uh, that's an anticipation that we're going to have. Uh, but again, uh, at some point we anticipate that the nursing home and assisted living cases are gonna drop off because we've tested everybody and we've identified the positives and their visitors aren't being allowed. So through the quarantine process and the healing process, those cases should go away. We didn't have those cases in the beginning of this process. Uh, we've had them the last two weeks. Those cases should go away. Contacts are, are complicated for many of those who live in tight living corridors with large families. Uh, think about if you're in an apartment, you have kids, you have one bathroom. Uh, uh, that's, that's a tough situation to be in, to be in isolation if you're COVID positive. We're seeing uh, more of those contacts happen from that. Uh, that's kind of expected. Uh, the good news for the community is that those folks are already in a quarantine situation. So the risk to the community at large is limited. But again, those are people that we then have to treat and get better uh, still. When we look at the cases, 676 are female, 502 are male, 38 are under 19, 195 in their 20s, 150 in their 30s, 157 in their 40s, 192 in their 50s, 172 in their 60s, 126 in their 70s, 98 in their 80s, and 50 in their 90s. 20% of our cases have been under 30 years of age, 33% under 40, 46% under 50, 62% under 60, and 38% over 60. 
uh, break down by municipality, 605 cases are now uh, the city of Syracuse total cases. We've had 269 people recover. Town of Clay, 102 total cases, 72 recoveries. Town of Onondaga, 88 total cases, 29 recoveries. Manlius, 59 cases, 42 recoveries. DeWitt, 57 cases, 33 recoveries. Salina, 48 cases, 33 recoveries. Cicero, 43 cases, 29 recoveries. Camillus, 40 cases, 30 recoveries. Gaddis, 40 cases, 21 recoveries. Lysander, 29 cases, 19 recoveries. Pompey, 22 cases, 20 recoveries. Skinny Atlas, 15 cases, 13 recoveries. Van Buren, eight cases, three recoveries. Lafayette, four cases, three recoveries. Marcellus, five cases, four recoveries. Atisco, five cases, four recoveries. Elbridge, two cases, two recoveries. Fabius, two cases, two recoveries. Spafford, two cases, two recoveries. And Tully, two cases, two recoveries. Um, so geographically, what we have seen is uh, essentially if there are buildings with density, specifically nursing homes or assisted living facilities, the virus has found their way into those buildings. If those buildings sit in a, sp a specific municipality, that's going to impact the number of cases you have. Uh, when what we're now doing related to community spread is we're breaking those out. We're looking for emerging patterns uh, through the data, and that's going to drive further proactive testing. Again, the idea being about proactive testing is it's not about the positive numbers anymore. It's about finding the virus and quarantining it and isolating it, the hidden pockets around the community. Uh, and we know if you're going to do more testing, you're going to get a lot of asymptomatic tests. Uh, in these pockets, uh, I'll give you an example. We got an email. We had a positive from, they lived in an apartment complex. The property manager emails us, says there's other people with symptoms. We're going to go test the whole apartment complex. We're going to find asymptomatic cases. Uh, that's what's happened with a lot of these senior facilities. So we're going to continue to do this. Uh, we're going to uh, proactively have strategies in municipalities now. Uh, we will go into specific neighborhoods. We will probably... Uh, do testing and advertise for testing with potentially mobile testing units in specific neighborhoods to try to find hidden pockets. Uh, we will do this in the city. We will do this in the suburbs. Uh, we will continue our uh, robust proactive testing with our independent living facilities and the Syracuse Housing Authority uh, complex in the next week to two weeks. Uh, and we will continue to be very proactive getting, uh, working with our partners in government by getting masks out to the neighborhoods uh, many, many people, if you live in a, a, a two-family property, uh, you have adults, you have children. The front porch is a, you know, a place where a lot of people hang out. It's where they go outside. Uh, many, you have chances to have many families there, um, more density. We're going to get out and make sure these communities where there's more density, uh, there's a lot of proactive testing so that we get in front of everything. Um, restart. Uh, again, the, the more and more guidance from the state, helpful. Uh, I was on a call with all the county executives across the state last night. Uh, very helpful for us to share uh, stories that we're seeing in different parts of the state. Uh, many of our colleagues down in Long Island and the Hudson Valley that have been devastated by this virus, it's just good to hear their voices and uh, make sure they're okay, their communities are making progress, it's very good. Uh, we continue to have conversations within the central region with our leaders. I talked to almost every leader in the county today. Actually, I think I did in the central region. Uh, and certainly our partners in the Mohawk Valley. Uh, more and more feedback with the state of New York. Uh, we believe the metrics that the governor has put out, we have met. Uh, and with the seven-day average, the way he's looking at it to start related to testing, uh, we average our five-day average is 457 a day in Onondaga County. Uh, so that's essentially meeting our criteria. We're gonna even boost that up. Uh, and we talked to all the other uh, counties as well in the central region about doing more proactive testing. Start going into your assisted living facilities, your independent living facilities. Uh, and if you need help with test kits, we'll help you. Uh, you know, let's, uh, let's learn from each other uh, and, and be very proactive in this uh, to find these hidden pockets of the virus, but also uh, to meet our mandates that the governor has put in front of us. Um, access, oh, uh, one other uh, restart, a little bit of news here. We mentioned libraries. Uh, we are going to open up our libraries on May 26th 
for curbside pickup uh, of books. We're going to, uh, next week we'll unveil what that program looks like, uh, but we will have a phased in uh, approach to opening up our libraries, but uh, curbside pickup will begin on May 26th uh, at the county libraries. Uh, and we'll, again, next week we'll talk about what curbside pickup means, uh, what that is, how that works. Access to assistance, uh, testing, upstate triage hotline for our uh, testing triage site at the Syracuse Community Health Center, 315-464-3979. If you need a test, uh, you're sick, you're symptomatic, call this, you'll get screened. They'll then get you down to the triage testing site. Our seniors, our health care workers, and adult nutrition hotline, a hotline for a variety of needs for individuals who uh, are running into uh, challenges to get basic needs and goods for the first time in their lives, 315-218-1987. Our daycare program for essential business employees, uh, free through the month of uh, May, we're in May. Uh, that phone number, 315-446-1220, uh, through our partner, Child Care Solutions. Uh, and again, 211, call 211 uh, for social and emotional support. Uh, our mental health is very important for all of us to function uh, as a family, as an individual, as a, as a society. So please uh, take care of yourself. If you need help, please contact 211. Questions? Will you elaborate on your plan to send mobile testing units into city and suburban neighborhoods? Yeah, so there, we talked a little bit about the mandates moving forward on us. Uh, and that's why this is a pivot in strategy. And uh, so when you have, to date, it's been about flattening the curve. We've essentially done that. Hospitals are okay. That was the goal, to flatten the curve. Hospitals uh, stabilized. We can, we can treat our sick. We've accomplished that. Uh, it was then about trying to get our numbers down for a period of time. Uh, we then felt in our vulnerable communities that there was uh, pockets that were out there, and so we proactively tested. We kind of pivoted from that strategy. Uh, if we wanted our numbers to keep going down, we would have just tested symptomatic individuals. Remember, for a period of time, we got very few tests, um, positive cases, because we only had so many tests outstanding. The 8% rule was the same when we had 100 outstanding tests compared to getting back 800. So, but that's not the right thing to do, is not to test. It's not the right thing to do. And so we started proactive testing. We went through essentially all our assisted living facilities. Uh, one owner who owned uh, two, now we're going out there. Uh, the other owner of the other one we're talking to, uh, we'll have that conversation uh, and hopefully we'll test her uh, facility as well. Uh, but the, uh, now we got to proactively, we got to essentially test 14,000 people in a month. So how do you do that? Uh, how do you do that in a way where it matters? The randomness of the, the wild, wild west of testing isn't something I'm comfortable with. Um, we're going to have to figure out how we have 14,000 tests done where our emergency management team can tell me that's how many we had done and where it is and why. Uh, I, I read about more tests coming online with all these facilities. It will be very difficult to capture all that data if you have 100 different people doing testing. So we're going to do it strategically. Uh, we know we have independent living facilities. We know we have the Syracuse uh, Housing Authorities asked us to test all their buildings. We're going to do that. But when we look at the community spread, if there is either a underrepresented demographic in the testing numbers uh, and in certain cases, uh, you'd be surprised who's underrepresented in the testing. Um, and then, or if there is uh, demographics where you're seeing potential trends that could be troubling, you go and you go test, and you test in that neighborhood, and you test everybody that will take, that will take a test. Uh, so that's kind of what we're going to do. Uh, and that's going to require outreach in neighborhoods, uh, credible messengers, uh, but if you aren't seeing, in, in a certain ge geography, if you aren't seeing uh, certain demographics testing enough, and that could be Caucasians in certain ge geographies, then you gotta go into neighborhoods where you're gonna find 
Caucasians, and you got to test them in those neighborhoods. So, uh, you know, the strategy's changed now. So it's not so much about positives. Obviously, we don't want positives. We know there's going to be positives. Uh, it's about we need to do 14,000 tests. How can we do this in a way uh, where it helps us limit the spread uh, in, in being surgical and being and using the data and making good decisions? So the state is ordering you to do 14,000 tests a month, but you don't want to give a general invitation and say 14,000 people line up. You want to test people. You want to test people with a strategy. You want to test people yeah. who you feel need to be tested. Yeah, if, if your goal is to try to have results to limit the spread, there's got to be a strategy. Um, and again, I saw a report that Urgent Care is now going to do, or I think it's Urgent Care, they're going to do testing. Uh, we would really like to talk to them to understand w what they're doing, how they're doing it, how th that can be. If we don't know how they're doing it, we can't use that information into our plan. Uh, and so uh, to everything we're going to do is to limit the spread of this virus based off of the data that we see related to positive cases. We're the only ones that have this information. So we're the only ones that can dictate the strategy. Um, and so all these other tools that are becoming available, they're nice if they play within the strategy. Ryan, are you thinking though in terms of like vans going out to certain areas for mobile testing? And when, when would something like that start? Yeah, we'll probably start. It, Exactly. And so uh, there's going to need to be a plan. We're going to work with our local uh, leaders, governmental leaders, and uh, in areas that we feel that we either haven't gotten enough tests overall from those communities uh, to see if we're missing something uh, or if we see some trends, that's where we'll start. Uh, but certainly we have enough proactive testing already scheduled to get us through restart. Uh, and then after that, we want to continue to do proactive testing, continue to test uh, emergency responders, healthcare workers, whenever they want to be tested, essentially. Uh, and but to, fourteen thousand is a lot of testing. I mean, that's a lot. I have to bring on new labs too to be part of this because uh, you remember what you were, the questions you were asking in the beginning of this when the labs got backed up. You have people calling you saying, "I've been waiting for seven days." You put 14,000 tests in my county alone on these labs and every other county in the state's going to have to do the same thing. The 24 hour turn times are going out the window. So um, we need to bring on new labs into our county. We've started to do that, uh, that we'll be able to bring them into the strategy. So we keep the turn times at the point where our health department's working in real time and quarantining in real time. So you're, you're wrapping up the testing in assisted living facilities. Are, are you now moving toward more independent senior living? Is that kind of the next focus group? Yes. Yeah, that and uh, then the Syracuse Housing Authority and probably uh, this mobile testing strategy will be going at the same time. Uh, probably not next week, but more probably the week after. When you look at your map of municipalities and cases, I know in the past you've said sometimes that can dictate where maybe a nursing home or a senior living facility is that has some mm -hmm. cases. Those are the reasons certain municipalities are spiking. But are you seeing any municipalities where community spread is specifically still a problem and that's where you'd focus some of this mobile testing? How will you decide what neighborhoods see mobile testing? Uh, where you'll see some emerging problems. The other problems are density. So we reference two families, three families, four families. Uh, there's density. Uh, there's different municipalities in our county that have lots of this housing stock, so we'll, we'll look at that. We'll look at that too because uh, you're going to see more contact, uh, household contacts with that same situation. Uh, so we'll look at density uh, and um, then we're going to look where there just hasn't been a lot of testing done. And uh, there's certain parts of the community where, uh, you know, Onondaga County is essentially demographics, I think 78 to 80 percent are Caucasian. Uh, there's certain parts of the community where the demographics of Caucasians aren't even represented well enough in the testing results. Uh, and so we need to try to get good data related to the demographics of that community. And if we're doing this amount of proactive testing, there's no reason we can't get accurate samples uh, now. That's got to be part of what we're looking at. Ryan, when you, when you go to the housing 
will you be doing blanket testing and not, not using the CDC guidelines for qualifying to test everybody in the area? Correct. Asymptomatic testing. We'll have to do, it will be a lot of work because we're going to have to register these people. We're going to have to know who they are in advance and then go. It can't just be just walk up off the street. Uh, we need to make sure we're getting the proper information uh, so that we have, uh, we, A, we, we know who is either negative or positive, but B, uh, we're capturing uh, that information. Uh, that, that's all the information that informs a lot of our decisions. Uh, but this is all, we're still going to be doing the CDC guidelines for symptomatic testing, uh, but it's not going to hit our numbers. We won't have enough sick people to get to 14,000, not even close. So we're going to have to do a boatload of proactive testing. Um, but the percentages at some point we think will go down from essentially eight when you're doing all this proactive testing. Uh, but uh, right now we went through proactive testing in areas where we knew we had the virus. We found a lot of asymptomatic folks. Um, the state's still testing nursing homes. They're getting positives every day. Uh, so at some point that's done. So you would think at that point when you're going into more random uh, testing, your percentages will go down, but you're gonna find positives. You're gonna find more asymptomatic positives. Uh, so uh, if, if you're, you're changing the rules from symptoms to get a test, that your your number of cases is going to go a lot up. So if we're doing 14,000 tests uh, next month from May 15 to June 15, 14,000 times 8 percent, that those should be the the numbers today that we have a new positive cases. Is this strategy just heading towards testing everybody? You could eventually get there. Certain communities, if they have to test 14,000, there it's going to be less. But essentially, depending on how long this mandate is there. Uh, you're going to get to a lot of people. Uh, this is a, this is a true endeavor. This this number of tests for us. This is not easy. This is really burdensome. Uh, and so our teams are going to have to work more. We're going to have to organize more. We're going to have to procure more and spend more money. Um, so you know we'll, we'll see how long this is sustainable for communities. Uh, in our budgets, uh, but that's one of the rules for restart. So we're going to do it. We're already we're already meeting it right now. But right now, it's, it's in our benefit to do this amount of testing because we know we've had these pockets of infection. So we're going to test everybody that is around the, the infection so that we can uh, stop the spread and save lives. But at some point, once you get through all the pockets uh, and you're testing a building and there's nobody, and you're just testing to test that. That's a strategy, but there's, uh, that's a costly strategy. That's a costly mandate. It sounds like community cooperation is going to be pretty important in the timeliness of it when these neighborhoods are uh, you know, looked into by the health department as saying, hey, we're coming to you. Um, how is that communication going to look? Do you guys know that yet? We don't. We're working on that. So each, depending on the neighborhood that we're, especially if we're going into a neighborhood, it's easy when you got the Syracuse Housing Authority. Uh, they have a management team. Their team's going to have to have that communication strategy with their residents. Uh, but when we're going into uh, random neighborhoods to do testing, there's going to have to be an outreach effort days in advance and educating that strange van showing up with people in PPE and masks and gowns. Uh, this isn't like ET. Uh, these are folks coming to help everybody. Uh, so uh, these are uh, things that there's going to be a communication strategy and uh, we're working with our local partners to do that. We're going to do it in the city. We're going to do it in villages. We're going to do it in towns. 8% of 14,000 is about 1,100, mm -hmm. which is what you've had over two months, let alone the next month. So if the caseload doubles in the next month, do you have like the tracers to deal with that, everything else that comes with doubling yeah. the caseload? Yeah, I mean, it, the percentage should go down, I would hope, because they're, even though our proactive testing isn't uh, being driven by symptoms, we're going into buildings that we know we had COVID, so we're getting these asymptomatic folks. Uh, but, yeah, we have the tracers. Right now, we have 140 people that will be trained, if, at probably more than that. Uh, there's not 140 people tracing now. We have... 20, 30, 40 people tracing, depending on the time. So just because you have that mandate doesn't mean that that's how many people are doing that. But certainly if uh, you're 
8% holds up throughout the whole year, uh, you're going to have a lot of a lot of cases. You're going to start to develop some herd immunity in the community as well. Uh, and uh, But that's why I think you've seen these robust mandates that the state has asked us to comply with. Uh, and we'll do it. Uh, and the, uh, you know, and we understand testing is critical in a restart, uh, and it's critical uh, overall to be proactive based off of the data you see. But we want the data to drive the decision-making process, and at some point we'll see if the data is the data is showing us the need to do this type of testing. It's quite a number. How's your confidence in the supply chain to have 14,000 test kits available? So th that's why you got to bring in more labs too. So the way it works with these labs is they'll give you so many tests per day at a location. And so it's their infrastructure, then it's us procuring uh, test kits ourselves, and it's the hospitals with their own test kits. So w right now we're, we're there. Uh, we're gonna stockpile more for the fall, in my opinion. Uh, but that's something that, you know, it's one of those COVID costs that you never had. Uh, we're going to have to go buy lots of test kits. And the state's been helping us out with some t test kits as well. So uh, that's good. But uh, nobody's been testing at 30 tests per 1,000 people unless you're in the war zone of New York City and Long Island. Uh, these other, nobody else has really been at that rate. Uh, so... Uh, their infection rates were 24% and 15%. Ours was, what, one, one point something, and according to the antibody testing. Our actual positive case numbers are 0.24. Uh, so, uh, when, you know, that's why they have done more testing is because their infection rates are so much higher. What are your thoughts on the governor had talked yesterday about expanding the use of technology in schools uh, down the road, even as we move past this school year. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think that could be something we could see over the course of the next few years? Yeah, I think using technology is good. It, it, it gives, if, if you think about if this, in 1918, I'm pretty sure when this happened to our community, everybody was pretty much in their homes, very hard to communicate. Uh, now we have Zoom, we have uh, all this other technology that we can still do things. Uh, we know so much more than we did now. Uh, but I, I, I need to say that there's something about the personal relationships with young people and their teacher that you can't replace, and uh, that merits results. These teachers can get more out of kids uh, because of that interaction and that contact. So I live with an educator, and I understand uh, this world pretty well. So I think you have to, from the standpoint of how you go back to schools, you have to use technology in a way that you can do it safely. Uh, but there's no replacing the interaction between a teacher and their student and the bond that is formed. There's no replacing that. So technology can't replace that. Did my mother call you today? Because that's what she told me this morning. Well, you know what, Andrew? Your mom's very smart. Um, as the regional leader, what's your interpretation of the spike in cases in Madison County? Very targeted. Uh, if you look at it, uh, essentially it's similar to what we've seen in nursing homes and a couple of assisted living facilities, right? You have very dense work conditions. Uh, my understanding is these workers actually are living together. So they're living, in, uh, and I talked to Chairman Becker about this. Uh, you got some of these workers living together, two, three people in a hotel room. Uh, so it takes one person to get it in a hotel room, living together, very small, very dense. The hotel all of a sudden. So uh, look at uh, overall, uh, it shows you this virus is still here. It's still very powerful. And if you can't physically distance and wear the proper uh, protections to help you, uh, it can get you and everybody around you very sick. So. Uh, we made a lot of progress. We've basically stabilized. Uh, we flattened the curve. We've preserved our medical infrastructure. Uh, we've stabilized community spread. Uh, but the uh, margin of error is still very small, if not zero. Uh, and so you get a building, literally a greenhouse, right? Controlled environmental agriculture. And 
It just takes one or two folks to get positive, and then all of a sudden you got a uh, domino effect. So very contained. Uh, Madison County has done a very good job containing this. Uh, so the risk to the rest of the community uh, is not very large at all. Uh, but it, it's, it, it shows you what can happen. Any similar living arrangements in Onondaga County that you're watching? And will what's going on in Madison County affect any kind of regional restart? No, no. I, uh, look, at cases, cases aren't, uh, people can't look at positive cases anymore uh, and suggest that that's a, that's a driver for a restart now. Um, if you get to 1.1% of your population through community spread, you got a problem, right? And, and, and it's not going to be the cases that shut you down at that point. It will be the hospitals that shut you down uh, because your hospitalization rates will really spike. Uh, so, uh, but you can't, with, with cases, you can't mandate the type of testing and not expect more cases. And you can't change the rules related to recoveries midstream and not expect cases to stay active longer. Uh, so, again, these are all things, when we started this all together, most of us were all together in this room when this all started, uh, the rules were different, and everything was different, and we've learned more along the way, and as we learn, the rules change, and we have to modify our approach, uh, but it's always been data-driven, and uh, it will continue to be data-driven with the way we make decisions. You mentioned a plan to test in um, housing authority uh, units. Are, are you seeing clusters of cases? We have not. Uh, Bill Simmons asked us to do that. Uh, what we uh, what we like about that is that there's a lot of density. So we know there could be asymptomatic individuals there. There could be positives with symptoms there. Uh, if again, same thing, apartment complex out in the suburbs. There's one positive case. <laughs> you know, property manager says, "I think I got other people. Somebody, they're coughing over here. We're going to test them all." Um, and so. Uh, a lot of density. If, if we see density, that's a trigger for us to do proactive testing. Um, just glancing at the a map, it looks like, uh, obviously, the city of Syracuse has more cases, but it, it looks like it's also the only community where the number of active cases um, stays larger than the number of recovered, and it's growing like 10 I think the town of Onondaga might be the same. Yeah. Uh, that... The, certainly buildings in those two municipalities are driving that and the fact that you're looking at a minimum of a 14 day period of time uh, before that. So uh, that tells most of the story. Uh, again, we're analyzing the community spread numbers and the contacts. Um, we're seeing contacts more and you see more contacts in properties where there's more density. Uh, and so that makes perfect sense, uh, but we're analyzing uh, any, not, I wouldn't even say a trend. If we see anything that looks like it could be a trend in these municipalities, you're going to see a mobile testing site there. Um, and so we haven't seen any trend in community spreads yet, but if there's even two more da days or three more days of data going uh, this way could suggest a trend, we're, we're going to be there. If someone's at home watching, wondering, am I going to see a mobile van show up in my neighborhood? What, what can you tell them right now about what they should? Again, it goes back to the question, what neighborhoods are going to see this? How do you initially decide where you're going to send the first cruise out to? Uh, potential trends uh, and uh, or if we are lacking demographic data uh, in a certain municipality, and overall in this process, uh, we're going to want to get that demographic tested. Uh, and again, uh, in many of these communities that, that could be Caucasian individuals that we just didn't, haven't had enough Caucasians getting testing in these communities for whatever reason. So we need to go get go into the neighborhoods and get Caucasians tested. There could be certain age groups that uh, we feel we need to get more testing. Uh, so we'll go do that. So uh, when you have to do proactive testing the way we're going to have to. Essentially, we probably feel we're going to have to do 10,000 proactive tests May 15th to June 15th. Um, so how can we do that in the most effective way that tells the, the best sto the, the story we need to understand and at the same time uh, 
prevents the spread and the, and the infection because uh, it's going to be quite an endeavor for our team. So we want to do that uh, in a way uh, where we're getting the most information and being the most effective at the same time. As we move forward from here with social distancing protocols, are we going to see a stage or a day where if I'm one person living in my apartment by myself and I want to go visit a friend that has also been in his apartment by his self, by himself, is that going to be a stage we're going to see before it's a family visit family? Yeah, I think we're going to get there, right? Uh, it's just right now uh, time is our friend. We learn more uh, every day, uh, but we also, you know, look at there's uh, enough data to suggest that when we have some of this spread, it's because of people just behaving the way they normally want to behave. And, uh, you know, my friend couldn't have this. Not a big deal. I'm going to go hang out. We're going to go hang out for a couple hours. Uh, but y your friend, you know, hung out with somebody that had it. And then three, five days later, they get sick. And then you get sick. So uh, the risk is still there. I, I think at some point the risk is going to drop off. Uh, and then it will pick back up in the fall, late fall probably. Uh, so, but we're, we're, we're going to get there right now. We got to learn, we got to, this is the next phase. We got to restart our economy, which is going to create more density, uh, which is going to create more opportunities. So we got to learn how, uh, and see what the virus does and, and really stay on top of it and learn the best ways to stay on top of it. Then I think eventually the, the, the threat will minimize a little bit and things will loosen up. Uh, and then you know, this thing might be right back at us viciously in the fall. Uh, at least that's what most people are, you know, projecting at this point. So then we got to get ready for it again. Uh, we'll know more about it if it comes back in the fall because of what we just gone, went through. So, uh, but yeah, eventually, look at I would love to not have to worry about physical distancing and go out and have a barbecue and have my, my siblings over and my mom and dad over and not have to worry about anything. I think that's where everybody wants to be. Uh, and uh, we're not there yet, uh, but I think soon enough, you know. Uh, but certainly if you're going to be around people, you know, physical distance, a mask, uh, for your good and their good. Um, Ryan, do you have any summary data yet on the uh, senior living proactive testing? Uh, what are you looking for, Tim? Um, well, like how many total were tested, how many tested positive? I'm, I asked the asymptomatic uh, question, but um, let me, I can bring that f as far as assisted living. I'll have that for you tomorrow. I know, we, I know we're at probably 2,000 at least tests for, uh, in those facilities, uh, proactive. Uh, I don't know the updated asymptomatic. I asked that question today. Uh, I know there have been positives. Uh, so. Uh, we can uh, figure out how many. When was the last time you talked to the grocery stores and what are some of their concerns? Yeah, I think, uh, look at the the meat is a little bit of a challenge for the grocery stores. I spoke to them last week. Uh, very scary. If you're on the keto diet, Trish, I think that's what you're getting at here. Have I been able to get my steaks? Uh, I'm very nervous about this. Um, but the overall, uh, from a protein standpoint, uh, th they made the point that certainly some of your beef and pork may be a little bit more str stressed for the next couple weeks, but uh, your fish, your shrimp, your chicken, uh, still in good shape. Uh, so from a protein standpoint, they brought up to me that there, there's still plenty of protein out there. Um, but I think that's one of the things related to what was happening in the Midwest with some of the uh, facilities with Tyson and others little backups, little slowdowns. I believe the president ordered them to open back up, uh, which should uh, keep that supply chain moving and get it back to where it needs to be uh, moving forward. I know you said details are to come, but when the libraries reopen on the 26th, is that, will that be all the branches? Yeah, it, it, will, it will be. Uh, we're going to work with our member library system as well, uh, but at least the ones under our management uh, we're going to have that date and they'll all be open for some level of uh, curbside pickup and we'll, we'll really define what that is. And then phase two, we're going to have specific hours 
for specific groups of individuals. Uh, so we'll have our seniors in during certain hours. We'll have uh, people with uh, medical conditions uh, in uh, with other hours, families in different hours. So uh, it, it's gr gonna take a little time before they're just open to the general public the way that they once were. Other questions? Okay. Uh, I want to really, really thank uh, everybody. Today's the start of National Nurses Week, and today we are actually celebrating National Nurses Day. Uh, certainly throughout this process, we've seen uh, the heroic actions of uh, all of our healthcare uh, workers, but specifically, I wanted to recognize our nurses today, both our nurses in county government, but all of our hospitals, all of our private sector partners, uh, very, very courageous individuals that uh, were very underappreciated uh, before this pandemic started, but certainly uh, will never again be underappreciated. So again, congratulations to all of our nurses on National Nurses Day. Thank you and be safe.